Good morning and welcome to worship with us at Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church. My name is Steve Resch, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm joined by Jonathan and Jessica Robson behind me. Jonathan is our associate pastor, and Jessica, our director of worship. Today is a special day on a couple fronts here at Walnut Creek. It's Walnut Creek's 23rd anniversary. Now, normally after our worship service, we have brunch and we celebrate another year of God's faithfulness to us, complete with birthday cake. But sadly, we can't celebrate in person today, but let's do so in spirit. Please use the chat feature and let us know how Walnut Creek has impacted your life and blessed you. We would love to hear from you. You can also let us know your prayer requests. So happy anniversary, Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church. Today is also Palm Sunday in which the church traditionally celebrates Jesus' entry into Jerusalem in preparation for the Feast of Passover. It's the week leading to Jesus' death and resurrection. So during this Passion Week, I invite you to join us this Thursday evening for our Monday Thursday service. We alternate each year between a Good Friday and a Monday Thursday service. This year, it's a Monday year. While I'm very sad that we won't be able to celebrate communion together like Jesus did with his disciples that evening, I am happy that we will worship the Lord together virtually. Join us next Sunday. It's Easter or Resurrection Sunday, and please tune in again as we celebrate Jesus' victory over sin and death. And finally, friends, while we're physically separated from each other, let's join our hearts together as we worship our great God. Join me in this call to worship, a text that's connected to Palm Sunday, uh, words that promised, anticipated what Jesus did, and words of celebration for our coming King. Join me. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your, your King, king comes, comes to you. you. Triumphant, Triumphant and, and victorious, victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. donkey. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Father, would you open our hearts this morning uh, to receive our King, uh, the one who has come for us, uh, the one who has brought his reign over sin, Satan, and death, the one who entered Jerusalem in order to take our sins on himself, so that he could overcome them, so that he could pour out on us your grace and your love, so that he could bring us into the new life of your kingdom. Help us to join those voices celebrating him this morning, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus entered Jerusalem to go to the cross and to take our sins so that we could come to him with our sins and know that as we confess them, we will be forgiven. And so would you join me trusting in our king and in his work, the work that he has done for us. And let's boldly confess our sins, knowing that we will be forgiven. God, God of, of mercy, mercy you, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to the paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's continue to seek the mercy of our King as we spend a few moments in silence. And lift up your heads and hear the good news of what Jesus has done for you. This is a promise from the prophet Zephaniah fulfilled 
uh, through the cross of Jesus. This is from Zephaniah 3. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Rejoice and exult with all your heart. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. Do not fear. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with singing. It seems strange to be taking an offering when we're not together. We can't pass the plate. But nevertheless, you can continue to support Walnut Creek uh, by online giving. We provide the link uh, for you as well as you can send a check via snail mail or arrange for a direct deposit uh, from your uh, banking account. Uh, during the offertory, please pray for one of our network church plants, New City Presbyterian Church in Hilliard, led by James and Laura Kessler and Heath and Emily Zuniga. Turn in your personal Bible or your device to uh, Acts chapter 14. Also put your finger in John uh, chapter 12, as we'll be looking at a few different passages uh, this morning. As we follow the apostles of Jesus through our study of the book of Acts, we see the spread of Christianity moving beyond Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the world. And as these church planters and apostles venture into farther and farther countries and regions, provinces and cities, the gospel message remains the same. But what these apostles are finding out is they need to alter or contextualize God's good news to different languages, beliefs, cultures, and customs. Different cultures, same gospel. Well, we have the very same gospel message that they had. And while we're predominantly staying in place, our culture is rapidly changing around us. 2020 is very different than the 90s and the 80s. And so we are taking clues from the first pioneer, pioneering missionaries and church planters how to share the gospel in our changing culture. So let's pick up the roving church planting story of Paul and Barnabas, and then I'll connect it also to Palm Sunday, Acts chapter 14. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd and saying, no, 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 men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city. 
life has its ups and downs. And that's just as true for the great as it is for normal folk. Indeed, history is littered with examples of the mighty and the powerful falling spectacularly from grace. Marie Antoinette went from being one of the most privileged people in the world to having her headless body tossed in an unmarked grave. Pui, China's last emperor, went from living in the forbidden kingdom to working as a gardener living in a shack. Richard Nixon started as one of the brightest political minds and uh, ended up being forever synonymous with corruption. Bobby Fischer began life as America's chess prodigy, but ended in reclusion under scrutiny from our government. Socrates, even his great mind could not save him from a tragic demise. And who could forget O.J. Simpson, who left stardom behind for infamy and speculation. Aaron Burr went from vice president of the United States to obscurity from the duel that killed Alexander Hamilton. He didn't throw away his shot. And Phil Spector of Spector Records, a musical genius, fell from grace and is serving a life imprisonment for murder. It looks like we can add Paul to the hero to zero list. With Barnabas, he arrives in Lystra, a Roman town, and usually, uh, as was Paul's custom, he would start preaching to the Jews in the local synagogue, but there wasn't one in Lystra. He couldn't speak Lyconium, the local language, so he used the trade language of the day, Greek. As he preaches, he makes eye contact with an engaged listener. Sensing the man's faith, he yells at him, stand up. And this man crippled from birth, whom the people I'm sure were acquainted with in Lystra, they knew who this man was. He stood up and he walked for the very first time. Well, naturally, the crowd was amazed. We have a hero among us. No, the gods Zeus and Hermes themselves have come to visit us. And so the priest of Zeus arrives from the temple of Zeus just outside of the city, and he brings with him oxen and garlands, which, was, uh, which he is preparing to offer as a sacrifice to Barnabas and Paul. And suddenly it became clear to these two missionaries that they were being worshipped as though they were gods. Now, they had no desire or intention of receiving the worship of men. And it was with great difficulty that Paul and Barnabas were finally able to put an end to this ritual of honoring them as gods. Now, one can understand how the people of Lystra could misinterpret the miracle of the healing of the lame man. It's not as easy to understand how these people could so quickly turn from worshiping Barnabas and Saul to wanting to kill them. Or is it? Let's look at the New Testament for a very similar hero to zero story. After raising Lazarus from the dead, the crowds were eager to receive Jesus. Throngs of people assembled along the road to Jerusalem as Jesus made his entry into the city. And by the end of that week, the crowds were crying out something very different. They brought the donkey and the colt and put it on their cloaks, and, uh, and Jesus sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem... The whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And then to John chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. 
Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And again, he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Verse 15, And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over him over to be crucified. And so they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha, and there they crucified him. When Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem, the crowds expected Rome to be overthrown and the kingdom of Israel to immediately reestablish itself to its former glory. But by the end of the week, it became very clear that this was not going to happen. And thus, the Messiah they welcomed at the triumphal entry was the Messiah they rejected before Pilate. Jesus went from hero to zero. I believe the same thing happened in Lystra. The people of Lystra were interpreting what they had witnessed at the hands of Paul and Barnabas from their own cultural and religious perspective. In his poem, Metamorphoses, the Roman poet Ovid relates a legend of a previous visitation by Zeus and Hermes to that region. They came in human form and inquired at 1,000 homes, but none of them showed hospitality. Only one elderly poor couple took in the gods, and the pair were rewarded by being spared when the gods flooded the valley and destroyed the inhabitants. And the couple shack was transformed into a marble-pillared, golden-roofed temple, and they became its priests. So the crowd's reaction to Paul and Barnabas is understandable. They want to avoid punishment and garner any blessings that the gods may dispense. They see an authority figure that will, like Zeus and Hermes, usher in a new age of prosperity and prestige. But in a phenomenal fall from grace, after Paul preaches, imploring them to turn from those false gods and useless idols, and after some coaxing from Jewish antagonists that followed Paul to Lystra, the same folks who were ready to crown Paul as their God, now stone him and leave him from dead. Paul has gone from hero to zero. In Lystra, as well as Jerusalem, we have to ask the question, what made the people turn so abruptly? One day, veneration is a deity, the next stoning. One day, hero worship, the next day, crucify him. What caused such a sudden change of popular opinion and fatal action. I think it ultimately has to do with authority and power. In his essay, Politics as a Vocation, written in 1919 by uh, the German sociologist Max Weber, or Weber, he emphasized the political authority that controlled the state can be composed of three types of authority. Number one, traditional authority. That's the power uh, by, uh, legitimized by respect for long-established uh, cultural patterns and habits. Um, think, think Tevye from Fiddler on the Roof when he sings, Tradition. Why do we do things the way we do them? Because it's tradition. There's also charismatic authority. And that's power legitimized by extraordinary personal abilities that inspire devotion, allegiance, and obedience. 
similar to Paul and Barnabas, charismatic authority. They healed someone. And then thirdly, Weber describes the third type of authority, and that's rational or legal authority. That's also known as bureaucratic authority. And that's when power is legitimized by legally enacted rules and regulations and law. Traditional authority, charismatic authority, legal authority. Paul upset the, legal, or the traditional authority in Lystra. You see, people look to the Greek gods and Greek mythology and, and to their priest religiously, and that was, that was their cultural tradition. And Paul debunked his charismatic authority by telling them that he and Barnabas were men just like they were, not gods, but mortal human beings. And when Paul's enemies tracked him down, they told those in Lystra that, that Paul was subverting the Pax Romana by advocating the kingdom of God, thus attempting to overturn legal authority. Jesus challenged Judaism's long-established cultural patterns. He touched lepers. He hung out with prostitutes and partiers. He treated Samaritans with kindness and respect. He called his followers as citizens of God's kingdom to live in a radically different way on earth. Rather than hating their enemies, they were to love them. Rather than seeking revenge, the disciples of Jesus were to turn the other cheek. No more eye for eye, but go the extra mile for those in need. Jesus' charismatic authority was a great threat to the religious establishment's power. Great multitudes flocked to hear Jesus because he taught with authority. His miracles demonstrated that he had power over the winds and the seas, over physical disease, and with Lazarus, even death itself. And people gravitated towards Jesus because he was approachable, he was kind-hearted. He was non-judgmental. And he even liked kids. Jesus was a tremendous threat to legal authority. The hated and detested Roman occupiers permitted the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees to keep power and authority as long as they kept the Jewish people in line. And along comes this young rabbi who tells the crowd that their religious leaders are hypocrites. They're blind. They're venomous snakes. They're whitewashed tombs. And they hated Jesus for it. How dare he challenge the elders? Now, Jesus refrained from armed political opposition to Roman authority. Instead, he proclaimed the kingdom of God, hailing God alone as the one true king over heaven and earth. And the straw that broke the camel's back was that Jesus proclaimed to be God's son, the heir to the throne. So Jesus had greatly upset the ruling caste, cost them lots of money and prestige. He made people rethink accepted things. He upset the status quo. He attracted the masses. He, he stressed the leader's hypocrisy. He beat their arguments. And most of all, he was always right. And so he had to go. And so they conspired to have him put to death. My friends, whether in Lystra, or Jerusalem, whether in China or America, whether blue collar or white collar, whether liberal or conservative, the human heart cries out for an authority figure to be trusted. One who will lead, one who will guide, rescue, protect, provide, and love us. We know this to be true when people look to a political party to be their ultimate authority. Tim Keller says this in Counterfeit Gods. When either party wins an election, a certain percentage of the losing side talks openly about leaving the country. They become agitated and fearful for the future. 
They have put the kind of hope in their political leaders that once was reserved for God and the work of the gospel. When their political leaders are out of power, they experience a death. They believe that if their policies and people are not in power, everything will fall apart, and they refuse to admit how much agreement they actually have with the other party and instead focus on the points of disagreement. And the points of contention overshadow everything else, and a poisonous environment is created. I remember Steve Brown of Key Life Ministries, who was uh, my preaching professor, telling us seminarians to pick dead heroes. Why is that, we asked. He goes, because dead heroes can't fall. They can have their statues torn down, but they as a person can't fall anymore. He had a great point. What if our heroes don't succeed? Or worse, what if those authority figures that we're putting hope and trust in fall from grace or consistently let us down? I mean, if that's been your experience, then you'll love Bonnie Tyler's song from Footloose. Where have all the good men gone and where are all the gods? Where's the street rise Hercules to fight the rising odds? Isn't there a white knight upon a fiery steed? Late at night I toss and I turn and I dream of what I need. I need a hero. I'm holding out for a hero to the end of the night. He's got to be strong and he's got to be fast and he's got to be fresh for the fight. I need a hero. Well, my friends, what if your white knight never shows up? I'll tell you what we do. Ultimately, after being let down, falls from grace, they lose, they let us down. We decide that we will be our own authority. We will determine our own fate. We will develop our own system of traditional and charismatic and legal powers. And thinking that we're always wise in our own eyes, only our opinion of life and living matters. So, so, so we live out of our own truth, our own authority. It sounds reasonable. Left with no satisfying alternative, we bet on ourselves. But here's the problem with that. What happens... When you let yourself down. How do you respond to your bad decisions? What if your judgment about something or someone was totally wrong and it cost you greatly? What happens when you, yourself, go from hero to zero in your own eyes? Paul preached to those in Lystra to look to the creator of the universe as their hero, as their authority. He's the only living God who can satisfy their hearts, he said. And my friends, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the savior of the world. He's the hero that we should look as our authority and that we should trust as our authority. As Martin Luther wrote, and we sing in a mighty fortress, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own chooses. Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus. It is he, and he must win the battle. Jesus went from hero to zero to hero. And while it seemed that his crucifixion put an end to him, it actually inaugurated him as king and established a new kingdom. A king that died to pay the penalty for his people's sins. An authority figure that took on the failures and the crimes and the judgment and the sentence that we all deserved. That's amazing grace. You see, it was on the cross that, that God poured out all his wrath out on injustice and abuse and lies and sins 
of the world into Jesus' heart. And Jesus paid it all. And if you believe in him, then you will be forgiven. Not only forgiven, but you will receive all of the goodness that Jesus did apply to your own account. And so I ask you, will you believe that? Will you trust Jesus to be your hero? Will you abdicate the throne of your own heart and allow Jesus Christ to be the ruling authority in your life? Now, Jesus just doesn't become your authority and your hero. Let's take it one more step, and with this, I'll conclude. What's the root of authority? author. God is the author of your story. He's the author of my story, of, of Tammy's story, of my kids' and grandkids' stories. And as the author, he has creative license, the authority to shape me and to shape my world and to shape my character. We're not the authors of our own story, as this coronavirus pandemic has so aptly shown us. But the living God and his son, Jesus Christ, are the ones writing our story. And this living, merciful, patient, and gracious God is the only Lord who, if you find him, can truly fulfill you. And if you fail him, can truly forgive you. From hero to zero, let's look to Jesus as our hero, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's pray. Lord, we are questioning the author of the story of the world right now because these are difficult times. And Jesus, you yourself, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Lord, we pray that you would overcome the world, but you would overcome our hearts. That we might look to you as the authority and the power in the life that we need, the hero that comes and rescues us from this fallen world and from ourselves. Help us to trust in you and to walk by faith and not by our own sight. In Jesus' name, amen. As we confess our faith every week, we embrace the story that God is telling with this world. And we not only embrace the story, we embrace the author as our ultimate trust. And so would you join me now? as we confess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we continue to put our trust in the hands of our author. We put our story as individuals and as a church uh, in his hands uh, as we pray together. And this is an opportunity uh, for us uh, to remind ourselves that we are not alone. Though we may be worshiping at home uh, this morning and feel isolated, we are not alone. We are connected because God is with us and we are connected by the prayers that we pray together. And so I'll remind you that we'll start with a responsive reading, and then I will say, and for what else should we pray? I'll leave an open time of silence, encourage you to pray out loud where you are uh, for needs in your life and your, your world, and then we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. And so let's come to the wise and good author.
of our story. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church. We, we bless you, you for our creation and preservation, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. As we lament our separation during this time of disease, give us such an awareness of your presence that with, with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving, giving up ourselves to your, your service. And for what else should we pray? Now gathering all our prayers into one, let us pray boldly as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the, the glory, glory forever, forever and, and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning on our anniversary, 23rd anniversary. Blessed be the name of the Lord who has uh, sustained us and has blessed us uh, for over two decades. Continue to uh, leave some of your chat comments and prayer requests um, so that we can uh, read those, agree with them, and pray uh, for you as well. Uh, don't forget, uh, Thursday and Sunday, we'll be coming back at you for a Monday, Thursday service, and then on Sunday, Easter. Now receive the benediction, a blessing to you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.